We are finally starting to see the end of progression in silicon chip technology. And it's starting to defect from Moore's Law which was conceived nearly four decades ago. Transistors, as we all know, are simple switches which allow your computer to run. But there is a limitation to how small they can get. These simple switches are pretty much incorporated into every critical component of your computer, including the SSD, system memory, GPU, and most importantly, the processor. There's going to be quite a few problems associated with these extremely small designs. But let's just look at it from a mathematical perspective. Now theoretically the smallest size you can get to is the width of a silicon atom, which is 0.2 nanometers. And right now we are achieving about a 3 nanometer design. So somewhere between 3 and 0.2 there's going to be a full stop to the progression of making chips smaller. Chip makers are constantly trying to find out how to dodge this ultimate limitation with different kinds of gate setups and obvious multi-core integration. But the end is coming and the end of Moore's Law is inevitable. This leads me to five alternative options which may replace silicon in itself. So beginning at number five and it's also probably one of the weirdest options out there and it's the liquid transistor. However, this liquid concept is far from conventional and it's an indeed a bizarre alternative to silicon. These circuits are made of gallium and iridium, and they can react with different voltage inputs. So when the voltage drops in one direction, the droplets close together. And once the voltage is applied in a different direction, the droplets open up. This method is no secret, and multiple institutions are experimenting with this type of liquid metal transistor. Ultimately, you can program different shapes through electromagnetic fields. But keep in mind that this does not overcome the limitations of atomic structure. I don't think this stuff is going to replace silicon altogether, but this could lead into some very revolutionary robotics that were never conceived before. We get to number 4, nanomagnetics. There are some distinct advantages of solid state drives compared to magnetic hard drives. But I still think it's quite fascinating to actually see a hard drive work, with millions of magnets incorporated inside of it. Now a processing chip can utilize a similar type of magnetic technology. This would work thanks to swirling nanoscale tornadoes of magnetisms, which can be flowed through complex networks of nanowires in a manner that reproduces the behavior of logic gates. So if a well rotates clockwise it represents a 1, and counterclockwise means 0. But more importantly, the vortices are non-volatile, and they retain their winding without any power. This type of nanomagnetic chip would use very little energy. And it does give it a possibility that this type of technology makes it a strong candidate for replacing silicon in the long term future. At number 3, Optical Computers. In order to make these kind of computers work on light, you need optical transistors. But there's a very big problem when it comes to light, and that is light has a relatively large wavelength, nowhere even close to this nanometer threshold achieved by silicon right now. However, there is an interesting thing called the surface plasmon. These are weird particles that can be excited on the surface of materials, so they can travel like a photon and hence they are faster than a typical silicon computer. But more importantly, it's more efficient than its silicon counterpart. Ultimately, light computers can be up to 5,000 times faster than conventional computers. And for processors, that would mean that it's running into the terahertz clock rate, which is just mind-blowing. Even though there are some companies out there that are using light technology, we are still quite a ways away from making a plasma and light computer. At number 2, the quantum computer. There has been a lot of hype around the potential of quantum computers. With the ability to represent a superposition quantum state, they can work millions of computations at once. Another reason why they're so fast, because each qubit which is added to the machine exponentially grows the calculative ability of the computer. But they do face a few challenges. One being is that they need to be cryogenically cooled to a level near absolute zero, which is extremely cold. Anything above that and you lose the property of the qubit. Another challenge is that quantum computers solve problems differently. And that is that they are not big data machines, they can only deal with specific problems, and they are not a replacement to conventional computing. So they may be good at predicting the stock market, or even cracking a code, because of their ability to simultaneously calculate these things. But when it comes to booting windows or playing a simple video game, they are not really that practical, and a classical algorithm will probably win in a sheer speed linear calculation. So ultimately, quantum computers will actually have a place in certain applications, 
but they will not replace your conventional desktop computer anytime soon. So now that we get to number one, you're probably asking, well, is there anything that's going to replace silicon? And that's a really tough question, at least in the short term future, because companies are still trying to innovate with silicon technology. However, there is one material out there which may replace silicon in certain applications, and it's called gallium nitrate. This stuff is a semiconductor compound, and it has the ability to conduct electrons a thousand times more efficiently than silicon. And it also has higher temperature variations. Gallium nitrate can handle higher voltages and temperatures thanks to its band gap. And basically the band gap is a range in a solid state where no electrons can exist. It's the reason why semiconductors can work, because they have excellent band gaps. Now, there are a few hurdles when it comes to gallium nitrate. And one of them is being that gallium is typically used in depletion type devices. So in a transistor, it would be stuck on one position, even though the gate voltage is zero. So that's a huge problem. Now, I still think that they're going to overcome this hurdle, but this also brings me to another material that I want to talk about. And that is graphene. And graphene is very good at conducting electricity, but it has no natural band gap. So it can't be naturally used as a transistor. There has been research towards layered materials which houses graphene inside and allows it to have a band gap, but it still needs a lot of work to get it into perfected state where it can be used as a transistor. If we take it one step further into the rabbit hole, there is actually a recent idea about combining graphene and plasmon technology. Yes, once again plasmons are showing up in a different concept to create logic gates. And I just have this strange feeling that plasmons will be the key to the next generation of future computing. So two plasmons and two different ribbons can interact in their electric fields. Graphene makes it possible for plasmons to jump into a different ribbon. So this could theoretically work as a quantum gate. And therefore this would be able to exploit some of the benefits of light computing. And as we all know, graphene is a wonder material which is a one dimensional layer but it's also very hard to produce and maintain in this form. I will be making an entire video dedicated towards graphene and its associated problems. But for now, graphene is not going to be used in computer chips. It might be in the future. Ultimately, we will probably not be seeing any short-term replacement to silicon, as the infrastructure for production, distribution, and sale of silicon chips have been set up and running for decades. Replacing all that stuff would require years, not to mention billions of dollars in investment. Nevertheless, it's only a matter of time when we will see the stop of regression in silicon technology. It's not really a matter of if, it's just when. So, let's summarize the potential computing technologies in this video. The first is a liquid transistor setup, which can lead to reconfigurable circuits, and even a revolution in robotics. It still faces the same problems as silicon in regards to atomic structure so it's probably not going to be a replacement to all computing applications. The second one is nanomagnetic architecture. These types of computing devices would be ultra energy efficient, and they may be good in mobile applications, such as handheld devices or wearable sensors, which last for years. Even though it's quite evident that they're energy efficient, it is still debatable whether they can outperform silicon in sheer processing clock rates. The third, and my personal favorite, is the plasmon-based light computer. This could replace every component which relies on transistors, and theoretically, it could display silicon altogether. It'd be thousands of times faster, but it will take several breakthroughs to get the advancement in the technology. Nevertheless, this may become the holy grail of computing. The fourth is quantum computers. They are already proven to be exponentially faster than conventional computers in certain calculations but they do not have the feasibility to replace conventional silicon computing. Maybe one day in the future when we figure out how to make them practical in every type of application, but for now, quantum computers are only good at specific applications. Finally, we have a short-term solution, which are alternative materials, and they can display silicon and be used in transistors. The front runners are gallium nitrate and graphene. These could push clock rates exponentially faster, but they have some hurdles to overcome, and they're not quite feasible just yet. Silicon will eventually slow down in progression, and there could be a huge investment in these types of alternative materials. Obviously, I didn't include every type of future computer, which would include DNA and molecular computers, but ultimately, it's going to be really exciting to see what happens in the future of computing. I think it's going to be a combination of all these types of computers for different applications. 
but it's going to be interesting to see what actually replaces the desktop computer. And I'd like to know what your opinion is on this. So once again, thanks for watching. Please like the video if you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe to my channel.